It is my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce to you once again, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. Let's give him a Rock Church welcome tonight. Amen, Rabbi. Praise the Lord. We praise you, Father. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Well, it's great to be back again. And uh, let me say shalom. shalom. You do it just as well as in the morning. I heard that the night people are serious people about the Lord and want more. Uh, so I'm going to share something with you. Before we begin... Uh, let me just do what I sort of have to do uh, for those who weren't here. But first of all, for those who don't know, I'm Jonathan Kahn. I'm the uh, Messianic Rabbi, Senior Pastor of the Jerusalem Center, Beth Israel in Wayne, New Jersey. It's right outside New York City, if you're ever up there. It's of Jew and Gentile, Together in Messiah. And I lead something called Hope of the World Ministries, an outreach of the gospel and compassion throughout the world. I wrote a book called The Harbinger, and I'm always asked for more revelation on it. And so w to provide more Revelation and the teachings behind it. They made a website, easy to remember, called theharbingerwebsite.com or theharbingerwebsite.org. So that's there. And to get in touch with the ministry for anything, teachings, whatever it is, uh, it's hopeoftheworld.com or hopeoftheworld.org. Uh, as I said before, and really this is new to me, I'm not a promoter of materials, but I need to just quickly tell you what we have there um, today, and that is that you can get, I don't know what the quantities are, but the first is The Harbinger, and that is, that is the book, is the ancient mystery behind, that holds the secret of America's future. As of Sunday today, it is, um, keep it in prayer, it's 28 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. I want to pray that the word goes forth, the repentance to the, to the nation. And the other is the Isaiah 9, 10 judgment, which is the, the, the essence of the harbinger, but with clips and with all the, all the you'll actually see all these things that, that are spoken about. Two hour, two DVD documentary. I, we didn't do it. World Net Daily did it, but tremendous job. And it's an easy, it's a, it's a great thing as well. Um, both of them will, it's, it's, uh, we were told it's about 20 weeks, the number one Christian video in America. So keep that in prayer as well. And both reveal it in different ways and have different things about it. Both re together, they retail about almost $50. It'll be available for $30 as a set there. Um, as, as said, and also, I didn't know they had this until they just told me, but this is the, this is the audio version of the Harbinger for something easy to listen to. Um, and that is six CD. I don't know what they're going to do it for, $20, even $15, I don't know, I guess $15. So um, that'll be available afterwards. And they, they asked me if I could do a signing tonight. So, um, so if you want, I will sign it for you. I'll be glad to do that. I can even sign the DVD if they have the right pen, because it's, it's a different thing. So uh, with that said, are we ready for the word? Yes. All right, let's pray. Father, we praise you tonight. We thank you to be in your presence together, Lord. And I thank you for this, Lord, ministry. And I thank you for uh, Sister Anne and all that you've done here, Lord. It's, it's an honor to be, uh, Lord, where you have done so much and with whom you have done so much. And Father, we ask your blessing now and your anointing in my weakness. Be strong in your strength and touch your people. Have your way, Lord, and anoint your purposes, your great and mighty purposes, for this nation and for this place and for all your people. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Jesus, the Messiah, El Gibor, the mighty God, in his name, and we say, Amen. Amen. This morning, I shared some of the mysteries in the Harbinger, but leading up to what we're doing tonight, and I, I saved one of them, a major thing that's going to link up with this. Tonight, I'm going to share a mystery of America and also of you from Rock Church and you who are of this area, Virginia Beach, and what God is calling. There's a word in Hebrew called teshuva. Try it. Teshuva means repentance in Hebrew. It also means return. Because with the Jewish people, repentance is always linked, not only returning to God, but returning to the land, to a place, to Jerusalem, to the temple. When Elijah called his nation to return on Mount Carmel, he himself returned to a place, to the place where the nation 
was covenanted with God to Mount Sinai. That's where he heard the still small voice. When Israel fell away from God and they were sent away from the land, when they returned to God, they also returned to the land and to Jerusalem and to the dedication ground of the nation. When Jacob came back to the land, actually I want to read from that. You have your Bibles, Genesis 25. Genesis 25 and verse 1, Jacob, or Yaakov in Hebrew, who flees from God, flees, well, from man, and, but he's really running also from the purposes of God. He comes back to the land and God tells him something in Genesis 25. Actually, Genesis 35 would be better. Just testing you. And God said to Yaakov, Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel, Bethel, the house of God, and dwell there, and make there an altar to God, and that appeared to you where I appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Then Jacob said to his house and to all those with him, Put away the strange gods, the household idols that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. Let us arise up and go to Bethel, and I will make an altar there for God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way that I went. And they gave to Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hands and all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under an oak which was by Shechem. And then they journeyed, and the fear of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they didn't pursue after the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, and he and all the people that were with him, and he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the presence of his brother. Jacob returns not only to the promised land, but he returns to the same place where God met him to build an altar there. And there he, he cleanses his house. He gets ready. He, 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 they repent, and they go up to Bethel to the place where he first, his life was dedicated to God. God appeared to him, and God gave him a promise. Well, I once returned to the place where I met the Lord. And I opened up the Bible, it was at night, and it opened up to that scripture. I didn't realize that we're Jacob returning to the place where he met God. I was raised in the synagogue. I'm Jewish, raised in the synagogue. When I was eight years old, I became an atheist because I looked and I saw the film strips about God moving and talking in the Bible, but I never saw the reality in the synagogue. The rabbi never got up and said, hey, God spoke to me today. And so I became an atheist. I said, there's no God. And that lasted until I was about 12 years old when I started losing faith in atheism. And I started seeking. I said, it can't work. There's got to be more. There's got to be a reason. So I started seeking everything I could, every book I could from science, religion, the occult, UFOs. And one day I picked up a book. I thought it was a UFO book. It looked just like it that year. It was The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. And God tricked me. And through the back door, I read it. I said, wow, it's like the UFO books. I've read about Jesus in those books. And so now I'm reading about it, all the prophecies of God that came true and Israel coming back, and I started believing. I started reading the Old Testament. It was the only Bible we had in our house. And I saw the prophecies of Messiah dying for our sins and born in Bethlehem. I thought all that was Catholic, and I saw it in our Bible. And so I started believing, and I'm telling my friends about it. I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't saved, but I believed in my head. I, tell, I talked about the second coming. I'm, I had to get up in high school for, preach, for speech class. I started preaching the gospel to them as a Jew who wasn't saved. And I was leading people to the Lord. My friends were coming to the Lord. And so I started getting wow. I said, well, you know, I can't just do this. I have to be right with God. If he comes again, I'm not right. And so I said, you know, but I, I thought that if you follow God, you give up everything good. You, you join a monastery, and that's the end of your life. So I said, God, I don't want to do that. I said, I'll make a deal with you. I said, if you give me a long life, I will accept you when I'm about to die on my deathbed. And so right after that, I almost got killed. Car accident. A, few, a little while after that, I'm in a Ford Pinto, and I'm crossing, I'm getting to a train track at night, and the light's going on, but the pe cars are crossing on the other side. So I said, well, let me check to make sure the train isn't coming. I go up, and I look, and I see a light, and it's not moving because it, it's, it was the train head on. I was right on the track. 
And I said, you know what, maybe I'm a little too close. Let me just back up. But now there are headlights in back of me. I kind of back up just about a foot. But I, I thought I was fine. I didn't realize I was still in the path of the train. So I'm waiting for the train to come. The train comes and plows into the Ford Pinto. It becomes like aluminum foil. And I, the only thing I could do was call out to God at that moment in slow motion. Just called out to God. The car was destroyed. I didn't get a scratch. So I said, okay, God. That's strike two, right? Can we renegotiate that deal I made? I said, let's change that. I, I'll accept you now when I'm 20. So that was the, that was the deal. And when I turned 20 on my 20th birthday, like someone who's the, whose contract had ran out, I said, that was it. I didn't know how to get saved. I didn't, nobody was telling me, except I was telling other people. So I just looked. I, in the Bible, there were mountains. I went up a mountain to the top of it. I found a rock. I kneeled down on that rock, and I gave my life to the Lord on the mountain. Now, I returned there years later after being in ministry on my birthday in the Lord, because it was my birthday on earth as well. And I came there at night with a flashlight and a shofar, talit. I went up there just to be with God. And that's when I opened up the Bible with a flashlight. I found the rock where I kneeled down. And I opened up the, the Bible, and it opened up to Jacob coming to the place where he met God. And then, but I, I opened it up again, and, and I'm not saying God has to do this, but it opened up to another scripture, strange, it was, in Ezekiel, it said, the enemy says, I have your mountains, Israel. I own your mountains. And I'm on a mountain. I'm saying, that's kind of weird. The next day, I'm at service, my birthday, and some of the congregants waiting to talk to me. At the end, they have a gift for me, and they give me a picture. It's a drawing of a man on a mountain with a shofar. And I said, that's weird. I said, and with a tile, I said, that's weird, because I was doing that last night. And they said, I was doing that on a mountain. I said, where? They said, well, you don't, I said, you don't know that mountain. They said, no, where was it? I said, well, I described it. I said, it's where I came to the Lord. They said, do you know what that mountain is? I said, no. They said, that mountain is dedicated to Satan. And on the top of that mountain, that's where the witches and the Satan worshipers meet. I said, that's where I came to the Lord. I said, I did on this rock. They said, you know what that rock is? That rock is the altar. And so I remember that on the ground of where that mountain was, that ground, there was graffiti, there were words there, and I never understood it until then. It said, no Jew shall enter these sacred grounds. And I took that as, that's what you wrote, Satan. That's what you meant. For 2,000 years, you haven't wanted Jews to come to Jesus. But I said, you know, because he knows when that happens, it's it for him. For 2,000 years. That's why, that's why he has that mount, the Dome of the Rock and all those things. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want them coming back for 2,000 years. But I said, you know what? It says no Jew shall enter. I said, too late, Satan. It's already happened. It's already happened. It's happening. And that's the, after 2,000 years, the Jewish people are returning. They're returning to the land, and they're returning to their Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, the, the, the hope of Israel. After 2,000 years... But to return sometimes requires a fight. Return to Shuva. I even being in Virginia Beach, I've been here once before, so this is a return. I was here eight months ago. God had me here on the very day that the Harbinger was released. God had me there, and now there, there is a purpose. I, tonight, I'm going to speak about the mystery of return to Shuva in Hebrew, a mystery concerning America, a mystery concerning you. 3,000 years ago, we go to another ground of dedication. Solomon is on the Temple Mount. We're standing in the temple courts. He's gathered the whole nation together to dedicate the house of God. It is a sacred ground. It's the nation's dedication ground. The king is there with the elders, the leaders, the priests, all praying the people. The temple is finished. The nation is finished. It's got everything. And now they gather to dedicate it all to God. And at times of dedication, often there are words of prophecy given, promises and warnings. And so they dedicate the nation's future. King Solomon prays, and he looks into the future, and he says, Lord, when famine comes, when plague comes, when, when all these things come upon the people because they turn away, when they turn away from you and you chasten them, will you judge them? Then, Lord, if they come back to you, if they, they gather and pray to you, 
and ask forgiveness here from heaven and forgive them. Solomon says he pleads on that inaugural day that if the nation ever turns, that it will come back. And that is the context of one of the most famous scriptures that you know that is part of this. When God answers that prayer at night, God it says God appeared to him. It says when Solomon did this all, the Lord appeared to him at night in 2 Chronicles 7 and said to him this, I've heard your prayer. I've chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens, that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. What does it say? If my people, some things to note in the original Hebrew. The word for humble, if my people humble, the word is kana. It means to bow your knee, to be into sub, in subjection. Not only just saying I'm humble, but I am subject to God's will. The word for prayer here is the word palal in Hebrew. It means specifically to intercede and make supplication, intercession. And seek my face, the Hebrew word here is bakash. It means to search out, strive after God. Beg him, beseech him, require him, desire him. Will seek my face, the Hebrew word is panim, means not only face, but seek my presence. And turn from their ways, the Hebrew word is shuv, which means to turn physically or spiritually from their ways. I will hear the word shama. I will not just hear, I will listen, I will hearken to. What's God saying? God is saying he is merciful. He doesn't will for judgment. He wills for mercy. He's willing that none should perish. But he requires his people to come to him and return to him and repent before him and humble ourselves and seek his face. What happened to Israel, the northern kingdom? It turned away. It was given the harbingers that we talked about this morning that are appearing in America now, the signs of judgment. But it didn't turn back and it was destroyed in 722 BC. It's destroyed, but the southern kingdom, Judah, they also turned away from God and they were also judged by the armies of Babylon, taken captive into exile, as Solomon had foretold that day on the Temple Mount. But something different about their judgment. When judgment came to the south, to Judah, It came to the Temple Mount. It returned to the same place where Solomon and the people had dedicated the nation and prayed for the nation's future. God's mercy, even in the day of judgment, the Temple Mount lay in ruins, the nation's ground, the dedication ground, a biblical principle here, that the calamity returns to the place where the nation was dedicated to God, that God is drawing them back and saying, return to me, return to your foundation. Return to the place from which you've fallen. And that's where that scripture, it's all linked to that. So when they saw that temple mount destroyed, they can remember Solomon's words and his prayer about this. They can remember God's answer. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. So when they saw that, they could take it seriously. And they did. One of those who saw the destruction and remember the word is a, is a man in Hebrew. His name is Yahu. We know him as Jeremiah. In the midst of the judgment, he lifts up a cry. It's as if my people, he cries out for his people and and seeks the Lord. He takes that seriously. They're taken captive into exile, but you have the prophet Ezekiel, same thing. He intercedes before the Lord, if my people. And then you have the prophet Daniel. And he's in Babylon, and he was not guilty as the rest of his nation were. He was a righteous man, but he still prays that prayer. In Daniel 9, listen to his prayer of teshuva, if my people. He says this, I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him, pleaded in prayer and petition and fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord, my God, and I confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him, who his covenant, we have sinned, oh God. We've done wrong. We've been evil. We've rebelled. We've turned away from your commands and your laws. We haven't listened to your servants, the prophets. 
He's a, he's a prophet, and he's saying, we haven't listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and princes and ancestors and all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, both near and far in the countries where you've scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you, we and our kings and our princes, that's our leaders, our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we've sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving even though we have rebelled against him. We haven't obeyed the Lord our God or kept his laws. Given through the prophets, his servants, all Israel transgressed the law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments and all uh, written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out upon us because we have sinned against you. You fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing this great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what's been done to Jerusalem. Just as it's written in the Torah, the law of Moshe, Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we haven't sought the grace of God, the favor of God, by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord didn't hesitate to bring the disaster for us. The Lord, our God, is righteous in everything he does, yet we haven't obeyed him. Now, Lord... Our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, made yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned. We have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and our iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant For your sake, Lord, with favor, look on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We don't make requests because of you, because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen and forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Wow. Wow. Notice something. Daniel is righteous, and yet he's praying the prayer of humility on behalf of the nation. He's taking all the sins, as it were, as if he was the one behind it, and representing the nation. Daniel is praying, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves. And it says something. It says, I will hear from heaven. Well, as Daniel is praying, things are moving in the heaven. And what happens is it says an angel appeared to him. Gabriel, Gabriel, appears and he says, Daniel. It says, when, Daniel, when, as soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. And then he says, but he gives him the awesome prophecy, Jerusalem will be rebuilt and Messiah shall come. Through that prayer, That's where that awesome 70 weeks of Daniel comes in. God immediately turns to answer him and said, I will do this. I will heal their land. I will hear from heaven if my people. Man takes one step. God takes 10 steps. God calls a nation to return to its foundation physically, spiritually, and in their case, physically as well. Now we move to another dedication day of a different nation. We go back 400 years from here to April 29th, 1607, to this spot on earth, to this place, the mystery of you. Something happens on the shores of Virginia. It'll be the beginning of American civilization as we know it, the turn of the century. There's a man named Richard Hakluyt, and his passion is to see North America explored and evangelized. And he sees, based on Genesis and Matthew, make disciples of all nations. He heard stories of the American Indians and they died without knowing God. So he believed in this godly, holy thing to start in America. He was too old to make the journey. He was too ill. So he encouraged his friend, Robert Hunt, to be a chaplain in his place. April, 1607, three Sailing ships come into these shores right here. The Susan Constance, the Godspeed, and the Discovery into Chesapeake Bay. After land was first sighted on April 26, a small party 
A militia began to explore the land, but it was a bad, they had a bad experience, conflict with the Native Americans. But a change came. On April 29th, a few days later, the ships come into Chesapeake Bay, a few hundred yards off of Virginia here. A scouting party led by Captain Smith heads to the land. Finally, he signals the rest of the crew to come in, and the rest are ferried to the beach. John Smith, his soldiers, and the ship's carpenters are wor working on a project. They, were, they are doing the first American project, which was to erect a cross in the sand. Amen. Reverend Robert Hunt comes to the shore with a cross, a Bible, stands before the cross, and they all together bow in prayer. They thank God, and they commit themselves to God's plan and God's purposes for this land. This day was the birth of the American civilization as we know it right here. The Foundation Day, April 29th, 1607. I went to the shore there, and the tour guide said there, he said only two nations in history were ever born by being dedicated to God, America and Israel. The first project before we sent men to the moon was the cross. And the next day after they did it was also significant, because the day after they dedicated to God came a blessing. They were received by the American Indians on April 30th. It was kind of like a, pre a foreshadow of thanksgiving. No battle. The, the captain laid his hand on his heart, and they signaled. They laid down the bows and arrows. All of them, they sat together, the, the, the settlers and the Indians. April 29th, dedication day. April 30th, the day they were received into the land. Those are important dates. Now we move to another foundation day in American history. This is the foundation of the American nation state as we know it today. It was being ready the same date, April 29th, they were getting ready. It would take place on the second date, April 30th of 1789. It's the first day America as we know it had a president over the government altogether, all done. America's inauguration day, like with Solomon, when everything was ready in America, it became an, in Israel, it became a dedication day. Now in America, everything is in place. And similarly, that day is a day of prayer. And people are told to go up to the house of God and dedicate America, commit its future to God. And then the, the first leader, pre, the, the first president, Washington, is sworn in, and he, he speaks and he talks, he starts speaking about the Almighty God. And he says, no people can be bound to acknowledge him or his hand more than America. He has been in everything we've done. And then as in the days of Solomon of the dedication, now America's inaugural dedication day, as Solomon gives a warning, and now Washington gives a prophetic warning. It appears in the harbinger, goes into it, but the warning in a nutshell is this. He says this. He said, the propitious smiles of heaven, in other words, the blessings of God, can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. What is he saying? America's blessings are based on America's obedience to God. If America ever turns away from God, the smiles of heaven will disappear. The blessings of God will be removed. He speaks about the order, the laws of heaven. If we turn against them, and we are living in that day, more than any other time in history where we are witnessing America disregard and come against the eternal rules of order of heaven has ordained. So it's a prophetic warning. He says when that happens, the blessings are going to be withdrawn. Very biblical warning like the warnings of the prophets. It's embedded in the foundation of America. What we are watching now as Solomon watched, what would happen if, uh, if the nation turns away? Will you have mercy, God? So Washington er, does this, and then after he gives that warning, the entire first government of America, the president, the, the Senate, the House, everybody, goes, walks on foot to a place to pray and dedicate America to God. It is the first act of the American government with a president. First act is not to pass a law. It was to pray and to commit America to God on an appointed place of ground, America's consecration ground, as the first day of the nation is concerned. And so they pray.
They dedicate America to God on the first day. 74 years later, after that prayer, the smiles of heaven begin to be withdrawn over a grievous sin that was never corrected, the sin of slavery that would lead to the Civil War. Many saw it as a manifestation of judgment, including Abraham Lincoln. 1863, the country is ravaged by war, no end in sight, growing sense that the nation, like today, had to come before God. Similar to what Solomon said, if my people. And it happened. A major national call went forth. The one who issued it was Abraham Lincoln. As Solomon said, when they confess their sins and they pray and make supplication, humble themselves, have mercy. This is what Abraham Lincoln proclaimed to America in 1863. It is the duty of nations, as well as of men, to own their dependence on the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and their transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with the assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. In so much as we know that by his divine law, nations like individuals are subject to punishments and chastisements in this world, may we not justly fear that this awful calamity, which now desolates the land, may be a punishment inflicted upon for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. We've been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We've been preserved. There's many years in peace and prosperity. We've grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which has preserved us in peace and multiplied, enriched us, and strengthened us, and have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our heart that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with broke, unbroken success, we become self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God who made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. All this being done in sincerity and truth, let us then rest humbly in the hope authorized by the divine teachings, talking about the Bible, that the united cry of the nation will be heard on high and answered with blessings no less than the pardon of our national sins and restoration of our now divided suffering country to its former happy condition of unity and peace. Now listen, he says this. Let us then rest humbly in the hope, authorized by the divine teachings, that the united cry of the nation will be heard on high. What is he talking about? Lincoln is talking about if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves. And when was that, when was that proclaimed? On April 30th, again, the same date. The same date that Washington gave the warning on America's first day. And so they prayed, day of fasting, repentance, humbling before God. Two months after that day of prayer and repentance came the climactic battle of the war, Gettysburg. It is considered the turning point of the war, the greatest loss of the Confederacy, the beginning of the end of the war. America would be rid of slavery and would then rise to become the most prosperous, powerful nation on earth. But at the height of its powers, rest, in, re, in regard to the rest of the world, America begins to turn away from God, removing prayer from its school when this summer is the 50th anniversary of that fateful national act, the beginning, and you don't see much of this in the media, it's 50 years. And then it removed the Bible from the educational system, from its children, from the future, and started taking down the Ten Commandments from the walls. And the process underwent a moral transformation, a sexual revolution, a war against marriage. And then in 1973, it did what ancient Israel did on its altars. It legalized the killing of its, of its children. Israel offered thousands, we said this morning. America has offered millions. America turning away from the ways of God and then against the ways of God, calling good evil and evil good. Or as Washington said, disregarding the eternal rules of heaven. And the result was decline and decay. Almost every measure of social index of well-being started plummeting. There was, there was division in the land, unrest in the 60s into the 70s. And the late 70s, even a lower point where many were convinced that it was over for America. The sun was setting on America. 
Even the president, Jimmy Carter, got on television to speak of a national malaise. In the late 1970s, America was in a very critical point, crisis point, economic recession. At the same time, prices, instead of going down, were going up. Inflation, stagflation. Unemployment was at a high point. Oil crisis, Americans were, were in, Americans were in line for gas. The inflation rate climbed even higher every year of Carter's pre presidency, 6%, 12%. America's arch enemy, the Soviet Union, was advancing around the world in Africa and around the world. It invaded Afghanistan in 1979. And then one of America's strongest allies in the Middle East, the Shah of Iran, fell from power. The revolution of Iran. Iran became a radical Islamic nation at war with America. The American embassy was taken over by Islamic radicals, 52 Americans. Every day, multitudes gathered in Tehran to chant, death to America, death to America. Some of you remember it. Every day, you turn on the television, death to America. America was helpless, couldn't do anything. Around the world, other em American embassies were stormed, taken over. Believers sensed, sensed that something was wrong. And then that we were in critical point. And this scripture came to the hearts, if my people. And a call went forth from two people, one of whom is here, John and Ann Jimenez, of this place, of this area where America was formed, where the cross was put in place, and the first prayer spoken, a call of teshuva, return and repentance. It was called Washington for Jesus. It was to be in the spring of 1980, a gathering of teshuva, it wasn't about condemning America. It was about his people humbling and repenting before God. Based on that one scripture, if my people. Just days before the gathering was about to take place. And when was it scheduled? April 29th, same date. The American government tried to solve the problem of the hostages. Just a few days before the event that came about, Operation Eagle Claw helicopters were sent in Iran to take the hostages. Disaster struck, a dust cloud came. One helicopter crash landed, another one returned, crashing into each other. And they were, it was, it was a, they, they crashed in the desert, never even, never did anything. It resulted in eight servicemen dead. A disaster damaged America's credibility all around the world. And gloom descended over America. More gloom. Even its military was helpless. And now the, Iran was displaying the bodies of the soldiers saying death to America. One article said, spoke about this. The New York Times, just, just two days before the gathering, said economic turmoil, turmoil already affecting more Americans in any time in recent history. And then the Ar Iranians begin publicly exhibiting the bodies of the servicemen. It appears death to America, death to America. The gloom was there. America was helpless. But then the gathering came, and believers came from all over the country to Washington, D.C., to the nation's capital, as called by John and Ann, and those who were with them. A gathering based on the promise given to Solomon, if my people, if we repent. Hundreds of thousands of believers came to Washington, on the Washington Mall, and there they prayed for the nation, confessing the sins of the nation, renouncing the sins, turning away from God, all those things, and praying and coming back in repentance. And, I rem and there were two specific prayers as well as all the other prayers. Everybody join hands to pray that where the Amer America with its military was helpless to release those hostages, they prayed that the hand of God would release the hostages. And secondly, they prayed with multitudes lifting up their hands to the capital praying that God would bring in godly men and women into leadership who would do his will. Two specific prayers in that day. If based on if my people, God will hear. The gathering was one of the most crucial days, I believe, in American history. In this day of gloom, I will hear from heaven. It would be a turning point in American history that would last up to September 11th. In many ways. The turnaround would be dramatic. Within months of the gathering, there was an election and there was a revolution at the polls. And a new president came in whose name was Ronald Reagan. A new government came in. And I'm not talking about politics, I'm talking about the spiritual realm here. 
A government and Congress filled with people who had pledged themselves to uphold the values of the Bible. The new president himself would talk about the need for prayer and a spiritual revival in America. He would even speak of America as the first Puritan spoke about America. He would call it a city on a hill. That comes from the beginning. The skyrocketing inflation ends. Unemployment fades away. The economy turns around and grows. It would become among the most prosperous times in American history. Some called it mourning in America. America's image throughout the world would revive. The, its military power grew strong. Its morale was restored. Its arch enemy, the Soviet Union, would make no more advances. In fact, it would begin to crumble. And by the end of the next decade, for all intents, it had fallen. And America would be the only superpower for a moment, for a time. I was with the actor Stephen Baldwin, who was an on-fire, born-again believer. He came to our congregation, and he invited me to come to his house. And he had another guest there, a man who had been at a, a council to the presidents. And he, the man shared with me that he was at a Bible study in the 1970s, and the men spoke about how God was restoring the spirit in the church in the, as it was in the book of Acts. And one of the men at that Bible study was Ronald Reagan. And at that Bible study, a prophecy was given that he would become the president of the United States. And now it would all happen. There was a mother who taught her son to pray and read the Bible, and she would later give her Bible to her son, or he would get it. And in that Bible, she picked out a verse, and she wrote next to it the word for the healing of nations. And the boy was Ronald Reagan. He would become president. His mother had a heart for the healing of nations. Don't think prayer doesn't change things. And don't underestimate the ministry of motherhood. It was prophetic. He would become president at a time when America needed healing. And the speaker, and they all did this months after the gathering of Washington for Jesus, there was a change. Already, there was a change that happened. The, the inauguration had always been on the eastern side of the Capitol. But Ronald Reagan changed it to go on the other side of the Capitol for the first time in history on the Western Terrace. It's been that way ever since because of what he did. So get this, he stood on the steps of the Capitol on the other side facing where the gathering had been. Now he's facing where everybody had their hands to where he is now. And now he's facing as if God's saying, look, I answered you guys. I heard from heaven. And there he is, and that's why to this day the inaugurations are there. He's standing facing the mall where they all were, where everybody lifted up their arms. The presidential inauguration was changed, and there were two specific prayers. One was the leadership of America, have your way, God. And the second was release the hostages, where man cannot move your hand. Here's the new president. Here he is standing where the prayers were. Here it is. And this is the beginning of a change that affected world history. It began with Washington for Jesus. But something else happened the same moment he was taking office. He gave his address, and then what happened is, in that same hour, all the American hostages were released by the hand of God. The same hour, both prayers in the same place where they were prayed. It was the beginning of, I will heal their land. I, the beginning of healing, if my people, I will heal their land. If my people happened, God healed the land. A turning point. But there was something else, a mystery. That turning point that began that hour. That the healing began. And again, it's not about up any man or politics. It's about God's hand. The exact moment when it all changed. In Ameri American history, world history. The president-elect was raising his right hand to take the office. The world saw that. But the world did not see his left hand. And sometimes it's the left hand of history that's more critical than the right. His left hand was on the Bible, on a specific page of the Bible, because it carried a verse. One specific verse for that moment that changed America. What was the verse? The verse was, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. I mean, that's amazing. And you believe that on the, the very, it's like God is saying, look, I hear you did, and I am hearing it. 
the healing of the lamb. With that verse in that place, everything at that moment. Why did he choose that scripture? It was because he was that boy. And his mother had written the right across from that verse, saying, this is the verse, Ronnie. This is the verse for the healing of the land. God in his sovereignty knowing it would happen. It was as if America was given a second chance. It entered an unprecedented period of prosperity and world superpower, which lasted up until a warm late summer morning in September, September 11th, 2001, when an enemy was allowed to strike the land, America was shaken to its foundation. What is September 11, 2000, what does that have to do with this? For those of you who have read The Harbinger, you know there's another mystery here. April 30th, 1789, when Washington gave that warning, was the first day of America as a nation state, as we know it. And when he was sworn in, he gave that warning, what happens if America turns away from God? But then, as after that warning, what happened? They went to the appointed place to commit America to God. This is, as far as a nation is concerned, there are other places, but as far as a nation is another foundation, the dedication ground of America on its first day, consecration ground, where is it? If we can find that, we will find a mystery. It has to be in the nation's capital. The first capital of America wasn't Washington, D.C. It was New York City. As far as when it was formed on that day with a president, in, he was inaugurated in New York City. And where did they pray? Specifically, where is America's consecration ground? They prayed, and America's consecration ground is ground zero. Washington prayed at ground zero. Adams prayed at ground zero. The entire government of America on that first day consecrated America to God at, right there at ground zero. The ancient principle, the calamity, returns to the place of the dedication. On 9-11, the same ground. In fact, in fact, it's not only that you can see the place where they did today, that little stone chapel in which it still stands, where they did it, and the actual ground where the towers was actually owned by the church, all one lamb. On 9-11, a shockwave goes forth from the nation's consecration ground, ground zero, and strikes another place, strikes Federal Hall, where America began as a nation, the foundation of our government, and the place where Washington gave his prophetic warning of what will happen if America turns away from God. And one of the blessings to be removed is that of protection. Here is the foundation, and the shockwave goes, strikes Federal Hall, the foundation, and puts a crack in its foundation. And all around Ground Zero, the buildings are destroyed or ruined, except one is protected. It was called the miracle of 9-11, what one was that? It was the little stone chapel where they dedicated America to God on its first day. Why was it protected? They said because there was an object that shielded, absorbed the force of 9-11. What was the object? It was the harbinger. It was the sixth harbinger, the sycamore. Which brings up the point of the harbingers and the harbinger. The message isn't to condemn America to judgment. It's to save America from judgment. If there was no hope, there would be no harbingers. And there'd be no book, I'm sure of it, and no warning. It's the mystery of return. It's the mystery of the foundation ground. America's attention was being drawn back to the place, like Israel on the Temple Mount, where it was dedicated to God. God is saying, return, America. Return, people of God. One of those foundations is right here, Cape Henry. You are of the foundation. Another is New York City on the first day, ground zero. Still another is Philadelphia, Independence Hall, where American independence was proclaimed and there was prayer. A few months ago, I received a communication from Anne. She and others found the harbinger, and they saw the connection between this coming out and the call for America, and the call God gave her concerning America. And this gathering in Philadelphia called America for Jesus. And she asked me to be part. I said yes. For me to speak to Anne Jimenez was a special blessing. I knew who she was. I knew how pivotal she with her husband John were in the history of this nation. I watched this happen in America. I knew it firsthand because I was there at Washington for Jesus. Now for you math majors, you figured out that's 32 years ago. And so hopefully you're all saying, no, no, you're too young. 
If you're saying that and you see me afterwards to sign a book, you'll get a discount on that book. Well, not really. But I'll sign whatever you want. I'll sign your shoes. I'll sign anything if you say that. If you say, no, no, I could figure out you look like you are, uh, then you're going to get a charge, a surcharge on the book. Yeah, I was actually a newborn baby brought to the, brought to the event. Well, I was. I was a newborn baby in the Lord. I just became a believer. And I said, I heard about it. I said, this is of the Lord. In fact, it was Washington for Jesus that forced me to tell my parents that I was a believer in Jesus, Yeshua. I remember praying there. I remember having my hand up to the Capitol for the release of, I mean, and for, the, for, the, for the God to have his will on America, on the government. I remember praying for the hostages with joined hands. And I watched it happen. And now, so when I heard that Ann Jimenez was led again, I take it as something very important. As I, we watch the course of the nation and the world, this is kind of like full circle for me. She's been moved again to gather to Philadelphia a return, a teshuva, as in the Bible, returning to the foundation by the Liberty Bell. And you know, there's something significant about that. The Liberty Bell has engraved on it the words from Leviticus. It says, you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land. The words are referring to an instrument, but not a bell. It's referring to a shofar. The bell represents a shofar. And the shofar proclaims freedom, but also is the instrument of the watchmen. The warning of judgment and danger, and also it was what my fathers on the Temple Mount would sound to call the nation to a solemn assembly to God. Here the Liberty Bell represents all that. And the timing is significant. It takes place in the Hebrew month of Tishri, right after Yom Kippur. Getting ready, it's the days on the Hebrew calendar that you're preparing for the Feast of Tabernacles. Why is that significant? Well, it was at the Feast of Tabernacles that Solomon gathered on the Temple Mount and dedicated the temple. And that is the time, this season is the time of if my people in the Bible. That very time on the calendar is when if my people comes. 9-11 brings us back to the dedication ground. And that brings us back to Solomon. Brings us back to that word that is crucial for America now. With this call going forth from here, from Rock Church, from Ann. With the same time, the Lord on our part, we're from another foundation, we're from the New York part of this mystery. And now the harbinger's going forth to the, to the nation as well. I believe in it calls to the end, we have to gather it, one of the chapters is, if my people, and I believe God has ordained all this. There's a sense, even um, among believers and non-believers alike, that America is in deep, deep trouble. At a critical moment, you know that just, I don't know if you heard, just a few weeks ago, actually maybe two weeks ago, Billy Graham, in his 90s, wrote a word to America, which he said, in effect, America is in trouble. America, he said, in effect, is under judgment. It is worse than when he said, my wife said, if God doesn't judge America, he owes an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. But he said, it's worse than that now. And he speaks of all what we have done. And at the end he says, yet I believe God is merciful. And I believe like Jonah, when Jonah went to Nineveh, that, that a prophetic word can come to America and America can repent. There can be hope in this land. We sense it. We watch what is happening. Things we never would have imagined would have happened even years ago. When the people saw the dedication ground in ruins, God was reminding them, if my people, and now we live post 9-11, the same thing, and God is saying that word, if my people, if my people will humble themselves and seek my faith. We look at America. We curse the darkness, we judge the problem, but we forget something. We in Messiah Jesus are supposed to be the answer. With him in us, we are called the light of the world, and we are called the salt of the earth. If we had been the true light, if the church had been the true light of, the, of America, it would not be as dark as it is. If we had been the true salt of America, it would not be as rotten as it is. Hollywood is not called by his name. Wall Street is not called by his name. Even Washington, D.C. is not called by his name. It is my people who are called by his name. We are called by his name. 
Revival doesn't begin with the unsaved. Revival begins with us. It doesn't begin with the media. It begins with us. If my people will kana, will humble themselves, bow their knee, before, bring everything to subjection to me, and palal, intercede and pray, and bakash, seek, search, strive after me, beg me, come before me, and seek my presence, and turn from their own evil ways, I will hear, I will forgive, and I will heal their land. If my people, it is time for if my people, for real, if my people, and we are my people. You are the people of Teshuva. Return. One, God placed you in the very ground where it all began. So that's right there, Teshuva, return. Number two, you are part of a calling, as it should go forth from here, a calling for teshuva, for repentance, for return. And there is the key. If we are going to call for a nation, minister teshuva, return, we must be people of teshuva, of return. And I'm, there's two ones, I would give you two teshuvas, which are the power of this all. One, the teshuva of your salvation. The return, remember when you first came to the Lord. And many of you, you were so fresh and so on fire. Listen, you love the Lord, no question, but remember when you came to the Lord and you were crazy for God. And you were all out, you even were foolish for God. People looked at you, you were foolish and you didn't care. You were so in love, crazy for Jesus. Revolutionary, before you got older and wiser. Some of you, you know, so, you know, that way, you know, some of you say, well, that's so long ago. No, that day is still now. That day is still now. God doesn't get old. You know, the new covenant is not just called the new covenant because it was the second covenant. It's called the new covenant because it's always new. In Hebrew, it's perit hadasha. It means literally the covenant of newness. So it never gets old. If it gets old, it becomes the old covenant. It's not the new covenant. It never gets old. We might get old in God, but he never gets old, and the new covenant never gets old. So that day of freshness is still here like it's today. If you enter into it, if you enter into teshuva, return to your first love. Get crazy for Jesus again. You can and you must. And the second return is prophetic. And that is we are living in the last days. The days of the return yet teshuva on a grand scale. We are watching as the Jewish people are returning to the land, teshuva. The Jewish people are beginning to return to Messiah, Teshuvah. If you don't believe it, I'm at one of the signs of it. You, every Jewish believer, it's a sign, it's happening. Jesus said it. Everything is to return in the spirit to where it was at the beginning of the age, which means it's time for we, the church, to return to where we were at the beginning of the age, which is nothing less than the book of Acts. God is calling us to be as they were in the book of Acts, to become as the giants of the land, as they were, as there were the prophets, as there were the apostles and the disciples of God who were on fire for God, who were unstoppable, who changed history, who could not be stopped. They even changed the course of nations. Let us commit to be that people because it's time for if my people that means to put away anything that has no place in the life of one so-called with such a high calling as you. It's time to bring into your life whatever is not there yet that you know God is saying, get that in your life. It's time to stop putting off till tomorrow what God has said, today is the day of salvation. Today's your time to rise. It's now or never. It's time to shine the light of God. It's time to be the salt of the earth. You were called to be the salt of America. We were called to be. It's time to get serious. It's time to get real. It's time to get holy. It's time to get great in God. If the dark is getting darker, then it's time for the light to get brighter. If evil is growing more evil, it's time for the good to get better and stronger. If we want to see the days of Elijah as you sang, that means the days of standing strong against Baal and the days of being bold for God, being foolish for God, and not shrinking back in times of persecution, but getting stronger and bolder in God as he was. If we want to see it in God, it is time 
to become as the book of Acts, to, to repent as they repented, to believe as they believed, to, to overcome as they overcame, to break through at any chain or barrier as they did, to become unstoppable as they were, to, become, to shine as they shone, and to, to change the world as they did 2,000 years ago. It happened, and even we've seen it right now, it happened from this place. Not, not, not 2,000 years ago, 30 years ago, it happened. You changed by your prayers and by America together, the believers actually changed the course of America and of the world. And that is possible. All things are possible with God. But he says, if my people, key word, my people, key word, if, take that if, make it a yes. Give God your yes all out, unadulterated yes, because he gave you nothing less than that. For Jesus, Yeshua, Messiah, is still Lord of all. He's still the light. He's still the answer. He's still the rock. He's still the hope. He's still everything. And if we want a nation to be for Jesus, then we need to be more for Jesus than we have ever been in our lives. He's worth it. Take your charge. Put on your mantle and go for it. For thus says the Lord, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. For thus says the Lord, arise, shine for your light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you and nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Amen and amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We worship you. Your ways are great. You are awesome and mighty, O Lord. We praise you, awesome and mighty God. You are the God who changes history. You are the God on th throne on high. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, Lord of all. Adonai, Lord of all, Lord of America, Lord of heaven and earth. We praise you and we thank you, Father. We lift you up today, tonight, Lord. We ask your hand now. Move. Let's stay in the spirit right now. Father, we ask your mighty hand to move to, Lord, to accomplish what you have for this place and this people and this region and for America for Jesus. Lord, we pray for your anointing. We pray for your, your ingathering of those you have called. We pray, Father, for your spirit to search throughout the entire nation to bring those you want to be there. Father, anoint every leader. Anoint every speaker. Anoint everyone who prays. Anoint every congregant, pastor, all who will come. Father, we ask for a massive outpouring. We ask, Father, for a massive move. You did it once and you can do it again. Oh Lord, we ask for the changing of history. We ask, we pray for America. Lord, we stand before you on the, in the same place where it all began. And we call to you from the foundation. We call to you from the dedication ground. We call to you from the beginning. And we pray for this nation. And we pray for revival. Whatever else happens, Lord, we pray for revival. We pray for salvation. We pray for repentance. We pray for a mighty move of your Holy Spirit in this land that was dedicated in this place. We go, give you glory and honor, Father, and we thank you, Lord. Help us each to live lives worthy, each of us, Lord. We pray this up in New York. In New York. We pray for us, and we pray, I pray this down here. Help us all to be worthy of the place that we have in this time, in this hour, that if we, Lord, you want to lift up your people, and that if the whole world would look at this place, they would have, there would be nothing to be ashamed of, only your light, as we are children of light, a city on a hill. Have your way, Lord, whatever in our, in our lives cannot be lit up. We say no to it. We renounce it. We put it away once and for all. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to burn it out, Father. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to ring in your anointing. And new things and new blessings and new powers and new gifts and new joy and new love as we seek you our first love. We want to be crazy for you, Lord. We want to be, we want to be foolish for you, Lord. We want to be on fire for you in everything, Lord. More and more and more and more and more and more and more, Lord. We praise and exalt to you, O oh Lord God. 
we thank you for this day. We thank you for this moment. And Lord, we just seal it all in your presence. We seal it all in your presence. And we just worship you and give you all honor and praise and glory in the name that is above all names, the name of Yeshua, Jesus, Mashiach, anointed one. Ari Yehuda, the Lion of Judah, Hasadohim, the Lamb of God, the Judge, the Morning Star, the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. We praise you and love you and give you all honor and glory. Oh, Lord God Almighty, we just honor and worship and love you, and we thank you for the mercy you've given us, and we ask for the mercy on the land, and we even ask, we throw in, Lord, worldwide revival. We throw in the nations we throw in it spreads to the world spreads to the nations spreads to that lord you can do it you can do it and we pray for the peace of jerusalem Yerushalayim, and your coming kingdom and the salvation of your ancient people and the day that you will rejoice when they will say to you baruch habab hashem adonai blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord we give you glory and honor our king and our god and we thank you in your holy name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Savior. And we say amen and amen. Praise the Lord. <sighs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I like shofars. I like shofars. Shofars are great. I hope we have them at the, at the gathering. Uh, I am led. I want to try to give you the blessing one more time, but I want to do it. I want to ask Man, would you come forward? Because I want to pray. For, if, if that's okay, I want to pray for you. And, and we all pray for God's servant. And if you just lift up your hands. And I want to pray and, just, and, and say the blessing to her and to all of you. And I just ask maybe a C or something just to open. Father, we just praise you. We thank you. Oh, Lord God. I, I thank you for this moment. I thank you, Father. I thank you for this servant, Lord. That was so important in my life when I first came. And now we've come full circle. I just thank you. This is why, Lord. And I just ask, Father, we just ask, continue to greatly bless, anoint, and hold, and strengthen, and empower, and quicken, and bring into your deep, Lord, deep places, uh, and anoint for power your servant, Anne. Lord, as her, great, as, as her name in, in your language, in the language of Messiah, is Chana which means grace. Lord, your grace be all upon her and even increased in the days ahead. Father, and gather around, Lord, the mighty men and women for this, for this task you have given her. And Father, as you use this vessel to change the course of nations and presidents and prime ministers and, and superpowers, Lord, we ask you do it again, Lord. Do it again, Lord. Do it again, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you. For, we thank you, Lord. We just praise you. Who are we that we can be used of the Almighty God, Lord? We praise you, and we, we just give you all glory. Lord, have your way, Father. I just ask your greatest blessings be upon this soul, this, this, this soldier, Father, and upon all her mighty troops, Lord, and all those, Father. And we praise you, Adonai, Adonai, Leolam Ed, Eloheinu, Elohi, Ayakov, God of Abraham, the Messiah, we praise you. We just praise you in your presence this moment, oh Lord, and we praise you from the foundation. We praise you from the shores. We praise you from the beginning, and we praise you to the end. We praise you, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Echad, Adonai, Himlach. We praise you, Baruch Shem Kavod Machutod. Blessed be your name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. We praise you, Adonai, and bless you, and thank you. Oh, in your glory, Lord, we, we delight to be in your presence and in your glory, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Everybody, stay in his word. Stay in the spirit. Just close your eyes. As you do this, I'm just going to try with the, what's left of my voice to do the ironic bl blessing that my fathers gave from the temple to God's people. You are God's people. You are, you are God's chosen ones, a holy people, a royal priesthood, a people called out of darkness to proclaim the excellencies of him. We bless you. Just, just 
Adonai Ya'er Adonai Panavalecham V'yichunecham Yisa Adonai Panavalecham V'yasem Lecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine on you and fill you with his grace. The Lord lift up the glory of his countenance upon every part of your life and your lives. And the Lord give you Shalom, life, fullness, peace, power, praise, all the blessings of his love. Bashem Yeshua, Adonai, Or Haolam, light of the world, Jesus. Kavod Yisrael, glory of Israel, Jesus. Tikvat America, the hope of America, Yeshua, Jesus. Glory to you, Lord. Glory to you, Lord. Glory to you, Lord. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. 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 We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll say what I said when God spoke to me about this. I said, I have no options. I have no options but to do what God's put in our hearts to do. God has put a special calling on this church to lead the way and to step out. You know, normally, after we have a guest speaker, everyone knows this, it comes to Rock Church, we receive an offering for the speaker. We did that this morning. And I couldn't understand why all this afternoon God kept telling me, you're going to take an offering for America for Jesus tonight. And I thought, how can I do that? I have, well, I'll take the church offering for How can I do that? But, you know, I feel like God is saying, because I, I'll tell you this, of all the leaders, all the leaders that are in, they said, and you're the one that has to raise the money. You're, you're the one. And I had no option. <laughs> and we need this event. They say will cost most of these events, like the call, cost over $2 million. This one, we're believing that we're going to come in around a million or a little less. All the travel that I'm doing, the church is not paying for it. I'm paying for it myself. It's not coming out of Rock Church. Everything that I'm just believing God for a miracle. And I want to ask you tonight to ask what your part can be because we need the fine. We're less than two months out. And we probably need about $500,000. We're two months away. So I want to ask you. I'm asking God for a miracle. Yeah, I've thought, wonder what I'll do if I get there and we don't have it. I've actually thought, I thought, well, I'll sell my house. I'll do whatever it takes. I will do whatever it takes to see that it's done. But tonight, God spoke to me this afternoon and said, receive, let people participate. 
If I don't tell you, you don't know. You'll, you don't ever know. So I want you to ask God, what's the best that you can do? What does God want you to do? If you have to make a pledge, take one of the little envelopes and write on there, it's a pledge. But every bit of this is for America, for Jesus, to change a nation, to call a nation back to God. So, Father, I thank you. Lord, I want to be obedient. You've spoken to me all afternoon, and I didn't understand how it could be. But, Lord, this offering is for America, for Jesus. It's going to help us go there. We're going to go there. We're going to do it because you said do it. We've got the word. Now we're going to put the salt on the bread. We're going to act. We're going to have instant obedience. We're going to do it for your glory. And Lord, touch hearts right now. There's some that could give much, some that can give little, but all can give something. And Lord, I just ask your blessing like on the loaves and fishes that everything that is given tonight for America, for Jesus to happen. God, that it will be multiplication for your glory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.